a good, a good dinner and that you're enjoying the food. Um, <clears throat> we're very fortunate tonight to have, um, uh, as, a, as a dinner speaker, my uh, former colleague Bob Bell from AT&T. And he's from the uh, statistics group at AT&T. And statistics has been something that's been very important to AT&T ever since the, uh, the time of Tukey. Um, and statisticians have done amazing things. Um, the, if you think about telephone numbers in North America, there are about half a billion telephone numbers. And there are about half a billion calls a day. And the system that AT&T uses to monitor and manage all of that voice calling was built by three statisticians. So it's really an amazing accomplishment. And I think that Bob fits very nicely into that tradition. And he's going to give a talk tonight which is part technical. And I think also it'll say a little bit about the difficulties that you have even inside a company about getting your company to use the great stuff that you've invented in your research lab. So please um, welcome Bob Bell. Thank you, Rob, for the uh, introduction, and I want to thank the uh, organizers for the uh, invitation. Uh, it's been a very nice workshop, and I guess I want to um, um, particularly mention Rebecca, who uh, not only has been uh, very, uh, very important in terms of uh, organizing the uh, the program, but especially these. Uh, you know, these meals and other activities, so um, uh, she certainly deserves a hand for that. Um, in trying to think about what to talk about tonight, I faced a little bit of a dilemma. Um, I believe that uh, when you're sp speaking over dinner, you should try to keep the, uh, the technical, be very light on the technical details. Um, on the other hand, I've talked about Netflix a lot of times, and I don't think I've had any audience that was in a better position to sort of gobble up the, all the uh, equations and everything and tell me what I've done wrong. Um, so um, I'm, based on that latter consideration, I've decided there will be no equations at all. So um, I want to talk a little bit more about some of the personalities and sort of the some of the uh, challenges that came came along, and uh, I think some of the idea of the technical details will arise. Um, and um, let me sort of start at the beginning in terms of uh, how I first heard about Netflix. Um, this is Chris Falinski, who's my boss at AT&T. He's head of the statistics research department. Um, and you can see his picture is a little fuzzy. Um, I think it he got overtly compressed, so maybe if one of you has a good algorithm for um, some of the algorithms I saw, particularly yesterday, maybe you could uh, help that a little bit. But anyway, um, he sent around an email one day saying, there's this great new data set out there um, that released by Netflix. And he was already a Netflix user, so um, there are a few things he loves. He loves movies. He loves big data. He loves competitions. and so. Uh, he was very enthusiastic about this. And a lot of us, uh, um, when um, he started to tell us about the Netflix data and the Netflix competition, um, got quite excited. He was saying basically there are you know, 100 million observations and, um, oh, and by the way, there's a million dollar prize um, to anybody who can win this. So uh, this is a little bit of information about the, about the data set itself for those of you who don't know it. Uh, the contest started in October of 2006, and Netflix released a lot of data, 
And the prize was based upon reducing uh, root mean squared error of predictions by 10%. And if somebody could do that, they could win a million dollars. Um, and um, they also had what they called progress prizes. Um, if nobody had reached 10% at the end of a year, there'd be a progress prize, and that actually um, was relevant. Here's a little bit more about the details of the data. There were the training data was 100 million observations on about half a million for about half a million users and 18,000 movies. Uh, movies actually includes not only you know what you would think of as first-run movies, but anything that's on a DVD. So it could be uh, season three of The Sopranos. It could be a um, a concert video and um, um, you know Barney video or something, whatever. Um, they gave the date of the rating, actually the month, day, and year, um, and the ratings for these integers from one to five stars. <clears throat> and there was some holdout data, which was basically the last nine ratings for each user, uh, and they randomly split that up into three pieces. Uh, one third, what they called the probe data, where they actually gave you the, ra uh, the ratings, and that sort of got passed back into the training data. And then the other two pieces, um, which totaled about uh, 2.8 million ratings, are the ones that you would predict. You could predict, make predictions once a day. You would submit a, a file with 2.8 million predictions. And half of those predictions, and you didn't know which half, were what was called the quiz data. And for those, you would be, they would tell you what your root mean squared error was. And there was a public leaderboard that showed uh, the leaders in terms of the lowest root mean squared error. And the other half is what they called the test data, and they wouldn't report what the root mean squared error was for those because that was what was used for awarding prizes. Um, so um, um, let, me, let me actually go back. Or let me uh, talk a little bit about when we had this meeting. So we had this uh, meeting of about uh, 10 or 12 of us that uh, Chris, had, Chris had sent around and emailed about 30 people, and 10 or 12 of us uh, expressed some interest in, in competing. And so we got together, and we were talking about what to do. And uh, the first thing that came to mind was what might be called nearest neighbor methods. So you want to know whether um, I would like uh, Saving Private Ryan, the movie. And the idea, one type of nearest neighbor method is you figure out what are other movies that I've rated that are like Saving Private Ryan. So maybe uh, neighbors of that movie might be other war movies. They might be other movies starring Tom Hanks. They might be other movies um, um, directed by Steven Spielberg. And um, that's sort of an in intuitive way of trying to estimate uh, uh, what I might give as a rating to that movie. And um, uh, as far as we know, that, that was sort of the most common um, method for recommender systems at the time. And uh, we don't really know what Netflix was doing, but they had set up sort of a target of how well their current system did, and we believe that they were using sort of a nearest neighbor method like that. Um, this graph shows um, some of the progress over the first two months. And you can see that um, it only took about two or three days for somebody to beat Netflix by 1%. Um, and within a couple weeks, um, maybe within three weeks, um, a team had beaten Netflix by over 4%. Um, so at this, point, at this point, it looked like, hey, this is going to go pretty quickly. Um, it, was, it was actually uh, at least about a month before I had any results at all. Um, but um, uh, within two months, one of the teams had beaten uh, Netflix by almost 6%. Um, and so you might wonder, well, what, what were they doing that Netflix wasn't doing? And um, the teams that were, that were doing well, uh, this WXYZ Consulting, I don't actually know what they were doing, but they had written some papers on, um, on SVD or matrix factorization methods. So this is a... This is a a graph, I promise no, uh, no equation, so I have to show you this as a graph. Um, this is sort of matrix factorization in two dimensions, where we, where we um, um, imagine what um, a two-dimensional reduction of the movies might look like. 
Um, perhaps we'd have one dimension that would be sort of the chick flick to macho movie dimension, the horizontal, and the vertical being the serious to escapist dimension. And um, um, uh, we came up with 10 movies, and we sort of threw them down in these two dimensions. Um, and you can argue with whether we've placed them in the right places, but hopefully this gives you the right, sort of the idea of how this works. Now, in actuality, um, the algorithms are figuring out what these two dimensions are, and there's no reason they have to be things that we would be able to name. And in fact, they generally aren't. Um, but this is the, the general idea. Um, and the great thing about, about things here is that the same space where the movies are, people can reside. And so we've, uh, uh, we created a few fictional people uh, and threw them down on the same axis. And uh, I like to talk about Gus in the lower right. Uh, Gus is down there near Dumb and Dumber. Um, and um, the prediction for how much somebody will like a movie is based on the inner product between the person's position and the uh, movie's position. So we think that, uh, that Gus would love Dumb and Dumber. We think he would hate the color purple, which is sort of in the opposite direction. And that's the general, that's the general idea, except um, instead of two dimensions, think three dimensions, think 50 dimensions, maybe 100 dimensions. Um, actually, a thought occurred to me. Um, the next time this, um, this workshop is held, um, there was a lot of video stuff or image stuff. Um, you really should pass out 3D glasses so that people can uh, have slides in three dimensions, you know, so that uh, you know, some of those people could pop out of the, out of the screen. Um, but for today, we have, to, we have to deal with two dimensions, I guess. Um, so anyway, um, uh, the way that things might be estimated is if we knew, knew what the movies were, and suppose that Gus had rated all 10 of these movies, um, basically, estimating where Gus belongs turns out to be a linear regression of his ratings on the, the um, two dimensions uh, associated with each movie. Um, and actually, instead of a linear regression, probably a ridge regression. And since we don't actually know where the movies are, we have to sort of alternate back and forth between estimating where the movies are and estimating where the people are. But it's a fairly straightforward process. Um, and stochastic gradient descent is another way of getting there. So anyway, that's, this is the method that started to really um, um, work well for people. And the, the teams that uh, uh, took the early lead are the ones that knew about these methods early on. There's sort of an interesting um, aspect to the competition, which is that you'd expect that when there's money involved, especially when there's a, a dollar amount that has six zeros behind the one, that people would be very secretive, uh, that you would go and you would be working on this and you wouldn't tell anybody else what you were doing. And, and for whatever reason, that didn't happen. So, um, and I think in part it was because of, of somebody named Brandon Webb who's, who had a, a pseudonym, who had a team name called Simon Funk. And uh, about 10 weeks into the, into the um, competition, he was up near the top of the leaderboard and um, he decided he wasn't going to win this competition. He probably had other things to do. And he um, made a posting of how he had gotten uh, up near the top um, using SVD, or matrix factorization, I prefer to talk to it. And he basically described the method in, in enough detail and with some pseudocode so that people could start to replicate it. And um, I haven't really looked at the results, but um, one of my teammates says that you could actually see right after that how um, the leaderboard started to, started to tighten up <laughs> because people who hadn't been using this technique over the next couple of weeks started to implement it and, and started to do well. Um, and um, what he, he posted this on the Netflix Prize uh, forum. Um, um, and. Um, that served as sort of a, an inspiration, I think, for a lot of people to say, here's what I'm doing, or um, I've been trying this. It doesn't seem to be working. Why do you, anybody have any ideas? And there was a lot of, there was a lot of um, communication of that sort. There was actually another 
another posting that in some sense was even more valuable for us. Um, and that occurred about six weeks into the, so Simon Funk puts this up about 10 weeks into the competition. Um, there was another uh, posting that happened around week six or seven, and it was a very simple idea. A um, um, person named Mike Lineker um, made a posting and said, you know, if you've got two different methods and you're trying to choose between the two is, as terms of which is better, don't do it. Uh, there's a linear combination of those two that is almost certainly better than either one on its own. And he actually um, put, up, put, put up formulas for how you figure out what that linear combination is. Is it, you know, maybe it's 0.76 of one method and 0.24 of the other method. And um, so he put up formulas for that and for, um, you know, how well it's, how much of an improvement you're going to get over the better one. Um, and so people started talking about, well, you know, maybe we should uh, be able to combine methods. And so um, that sort of brings me to Yehuda Korn. He was uh, the key member of our team. Um, and he had been developing a lot of methods. He had been developing some methods based on nearest neighbors, um, some improvements to nearest neighbors, based on matrix factorization and different ways of doing it with different regularization, non-negative matrix factorization, some methods that involved running matrix factorization, taking the residuals from that, and then running nearest neighbors on that. So, um, uh, and he'd been combining these, and we'd gotten up into the top 20, and then we got up into the top 10, um, somewhere after about five, about five months of the competition. And um, he was doing this by combining methods. He had about 15 different methods that we developed. And um, he came to me at one point and he said, you know, this is getting sort of difficult because what he was doing was he, he'd taken this formula for combining two at a time and he would say, okay, there are 15 choose two ways of combining them. Let's combine those, combine two in the sort of the greedy way that gives us the best, and then combine that with um, the best of the remaining. And, um, but there are an awful lot of different combinations. Um, there's probably some number theorists here who could tell you, tell me how many different trees you can make that have 15 leaves. Um, it's a big number, and it was uh, getting sort of overwhelming for him, especially if he was actually going to go beyond 15 methods. And it occurred to me at that point that you know, there's, we ought to be able to do it, uh, uh, do better than that. And after I thought about it for a while, I realized, well, it's, it's just linear regression. Um, now, we don't have the dependent variable, but we have sufficient statistics. So I gave him a formula for how he could combine 15 methods or an arbitrary number of methods to get the best possible um, mean squared error on the um, quiz data. And um, he really took that and ran with it. And suddenly he started churning out all sorts of new methods because now he didn't have to worry about how he's going to combine them. Um, and um, that led to uh, this picture. So um, before I show you the first two months, um, in month four, there was a new team called Gravity, which took over the lead. And it kept the lead for um, most of the next uh, three or four months. The little line down at the bottom is our team, Belcor. So, that was named after, uh, I, I don't know who Bell is, but uh, Cor is, is the first part of Corn. Um, and uh, actually, Chris Walensky suggested this as a pun on Bellcore, which was um, a research lab for the baby bells, um, started back in the 1980s. Um, so anyway, our team is, uh, you could see, was well behind everybody else, the, at least the leaders, during the fourth month. By the end of the fourth month, we were about 1% behind. Um, by the end of the fifth month, we were, like I said, I think we'd gotten into the top 10. We were still half a percent behind. But we started to really gain during that sixth month. And by the end of six months, uh, we were up near the lead. I think we took the lead for a day or two and then fell behind. Um, but we were really starting to, uh, to do much better by that time because of this blending uh, notion. Um, here is actually the results for um, the rest of the year, at least through day 363. Um, and you can see that we took the lead um, 
pretty much right after eight months and um, uh, pretty much kept the lead up until the last two days. There was actually um, an hour or two where another team jumped ahead of us and you know, we, we squashed them. Uh, but um, anyway, <laughs> uh, but we, we kept the lead uh, most of that time. Um, and so with about two days left in the competition, for the first year. So at the end of the first year, nobody was at 10%. So what was going to happen was there was going to be a $50,000 prize to whoever uh, was leading at the end of one year. And at this point, we were at 8.28%. The second team was the gravity team, the one in yellow, which was at 8.01%, I believe. Um, there was a third team at, at 7.98 called Dinosaur Planet. And um, beyond that, um, there was another, another gap to teams. Uh, we felt pretty, Yehud and I felt pretty confident at this point um, because um, uh, we not only knew that we had a, a substantial lead of about a quarter percent, but we could improve our, res our score to 8.38 percent at this point. Um, I forgot to mention something early on. Um, back when we first gathered to have a meeting, um, uh, Chris Walensky, who had sort of called everything, called us all together, uh, told us that he had talked to uh, an attorney associated with AT&T Labs and told him we, we were uh, planning to um, compete in this competition and, you know, sort of wanted the blessing. And the attorney said, well, you can't win this. Uh, <laughs> and the reason was, uh, part of the rules was that if uh, whoever won had to um, provide um, their algorithms to Netflix. Um, Netflix was paying for them in, in a sense, um, and it was a non-exclusive arrangement, so we kept the intellectual property. So that wasn't the bad part, but we also had to um, certify that whatever methods that we had used did, were not anybody else's intellectual property. And we had to uh, indemnify Netflix in case somebody else uh, sued them, and the attorney saw this and said, "No way, we can't, we can't take that risk." So, um, uh, at this initial meeting, Chris said, "You know, I recognize this might be a damper, but there's no reason why we can't compete in the competition. We just, we just not allowed to win. And besides, I don't think you guys can win." Um, um, that was Chris using his management skills that he learned at AT&T um, to uh, spur us all on. Um, so anyway, um, he, he was quite happy for the first six months, and then as we, as we got close to the lead, he started to sweat a little bit because um, he, was, he didn't really want, um, he, well, he didn't want us not to win, but he was a little worried about what would happen if, if it became visible to others in AT&T that we were leading. Um, and then um, near the end of the first year, um, with about a week left in the end of the first year, when uh, it looked pretty likely we were going to win, he actually um, um, sent an email to Netflix and said, "You know, if at the end of the first year we're the, we're the apparent winners, we may not be able to um, accept the progress prize. Do you want us to withdraw at this point?" And Netflix said, "No, no, no. We'll work it out." So that made that started making him feel a little bit better. Um, there's one other thing I want to tell you before I tell you what happened in these last two days. Um, AT&T Labs has something called the AT&T Labs Fellowship Program, uh, which um, provides a fellowship support to uh, students who, to female and to my underrepresented and minority students who are about to pursue a PhD in a field that was related to what AT&T Labs does. I've been on that uh, on the committee that chooses uh, flex winners for about ten years, and I was on it at that point. Um, and um, every year, what we do is in February, we uh, go through applications and pick some finalists who are invited to uh, uh, to the research labs to for interviews. And one of the finalists that year was a student from uh, Princeton, Lester Mackey. And um, uh, very, you know, very strong applicant, and we um, we invited him. I was actually his host, and I was talking to him, 
And um, I don't know whether I was describing what I do, and I said that I, we were working on the Netflix prize, or it was vice versa. And maybe I said uh, we were working on the Netflix prize, and he said, so are we. <laughs> and um, it turns out that we were, we were probably like 10th place at the time, and he was like 15th place at the time. Uh, and we had no idea about that. It turns out he, he did win one of the fellowships. He got, ended up with a summer internship at AT&T, in fact, working with Yehuda Koren. And, um, uh, but the reason I mention him is that he was part of this team, Dinosaur Planet, that was in third place at the end of the, near the end of the first year. Um, three undergraduates from Princeton um, with, um, I understand, some, uh, some uh, help from David, from David Bly, um, who helped to uh, uh, provide them some guidance. But it was still a, a very impressive effort by uh, three undergraduates. Um, so anyway, uh, going into the last day, we were, um, the, the competition for the first year was going to end at about, um, um, it was gonna end on Monday evening at 8 p.m. On, on, like I said, we're allowed to submit every 24 hours. On, um, so we were planning to make our improvement from 8.28% to 8.38% um, on, um, on um, Sunday to give us a, a second chance if we somehow blew it. And Sunday afternoon, we were looking at the leaderboard, and suddenly the two teams that had been like fifth and sixth jumped up past the team that was second. They didn't, they didn't pass us, they didn't come that close to us, but they jumped about 0.40% uh, percent relative to where they had been. And this started to make us think, well, what would happen if the first and second teams joined? Because they might be able to jump that much. But anyway, we figured, oh, well, we're, we're probably still safe. So we made our submission. We, in fact, uh, had been able to estimate exactly what we were gonna improve to. We improved 8.38%. Uh, looked at the leaderboard, you know, sort of waiting for it to show us with an even bigger lead, and all of a sudden we realize that we're in second place, and there's another team at 8.38% at as well, um, and the team is called um, When Gravity and Dinosaurs Unite. <laughs> <laughs> so the second and third teams, place teams had come together. They had scored exactly the same result as we did, um, but the rules say that whoever submits first, um, that's a tiebreaker. And in fact, they had submitted, um, uh, I believe, 72 seconds before we did. Uh, um, but that's okay. We have one more day. Maybe we can improve on that last day. And besides, this is all in the quiz data, so the actual progress prize is going to be determined based on the test data. Well, we had a very feverish last 24 hours. We were actually able to improve from 8.38% to 8.43%. The other team didn't improve, so we ended up winning the first year progress prize. Um, and um, here, is, uh, here is, in fact, um, the award we got. Um, AT&T got the $50,000. We got um, this um, piece of... <laughs> This thing actually weighs about 100 and, 160 pounds. Uh, it came in a big box, and um, um, you know, I guess the idea was you're supposed to put it in a sidewalk somewhere. But anyway, um, so that was sort of the that was sort of the story of the first year, and there were several lessons that came out of that. One was that um, um, one was that uh, there wasn't sort of a single method that was going to get you to 10%. Uh, the best single me method we had was good for an improvement of about 6.8%. And we had to uh, combine a lot of methods. In fact, we had combined 107 different methods to get up to our, our best result. Um, and another was that if you combine teams, that's a good way of combining methods. And it looked like in the future, for somebody to get to 10%, it was very likely that it was going to require combining teams. The other thing is if you sort of go back to, I don't know where page down is. Um, well, anyway, if you remember that, 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 that curve, it really flattened out. And so even though we were 84% of the way to 10%, um, it looked like it was going to be tough getting that last 1.6%.
And in fact, there was a lot of speculation about whether anybody would ever make it to 10%. Um, so anyway, um, but uh, uh, the year two was really Yehuda's, um, Yehuda's year. He came up with some great ideas during that year, um, some really good ideas for combining uh, nearest neighbor methods and matrix factorizations into a single model in order to um, um, uh, do a little bit more coherently and, uh, and um, improve results. And then another idea that he had, which um, was sort of temporal effects, allowing uh, factors to change over time. So I really like Gus. Uh, we've got Gus here. And the temporal effects models basically say, well, people's uh, taste might change over time. Um, and um, so maybe as Gus matures, maybe he'll, uh, maybe he'll be a little bit more interested in serious movies. So he might sort of move along in sort of a linear way over time like this. Um, but also, maybe all of a sudden there'll be a jump. So, um, so what happened is Gus didn't change as much as the fact that he got a girlfriend who uh, took over the uh, count. Uh, but this, I, this actually is, is relevant because what we were looking at was not individual Netflix users. We were looking at Netflix, Netflix accounts. And so a lot of accounts might be family accounts where there's a, um, you know, a dad who, uh, who rates movies on Saturday or something, and then during the week, uh, maybe the kids write, rate movies and the mother rates rates of movies. And so on different dates, you, days, you might have um, ratings made by people who have very different taste. And so um, this modeling he did actually led to big improvements. So we went from 8.4% up to about 9% um, when it otherwise seemed like it was going to be very, very difficult to move. Um, the other amazing thing about this is um, uh, Yehuda came up with in the, in the beginning of this competition, uh, Chris and I, who were statisticians, kept throwing, trying to say to Yehuda, you've got to be very, very careful about regularizing. You don't want to overfit. You know, that's very, very important. And he took that to heart to some extent. Um, but in these temporal models, he, um, in our biggest temporal mo model, um, what, he, what you have is this, um, is Gus. And Gus's position is allowed to change on each day that Gus rated a movie. Well, um, people in general only rated movies on an, an average of five movies on a day. So there were, if they rated 200 movies, which was sort of average, they in general rate about 400 movies, or rate on about 40 days. And uh, we, had a, we had a model that had, instead of two dimensions, had a 1,500 dimensions. And so you can imagine somebody, you're estimating a 1,500 dimensional vector for somebody on 40 different occasions and for each of half a million people. If you do that multiplication out, we, our biggest model had 30 billion parameters um, for 100 million observations. Um, <laughs> despite this fact, um, this was actually our best fitting model on test data. Um, it's only a little bit better than some of the smaller models, but it actually, um, Yehuda was actually able to figure out how to regularize this model and fit it well. Um, where are we going? Okay, so, oh, so the next thing that happened um, during the second year was we realized that um, even though we'd made, a, made great progress, we were still quite a ways from 10%. And so, um, we looked into um, merging with some other teams. And um, so, so let, me, let me sort of go back. We looked into merging with some other teams. So we actually contacted um, three different teams at, at different points with the idea of saying, um, would you be interested in merging with us? And if so, um, would you be willing to share some of your data with us and we share some of our predictions with you and just try to get an idea of how much improvement we could make. And we actually came up with a method that allowed for us 
uh, sharing, um, sharing our best prediction sets, but doing it in a noisy fashion, adding some noise, but still being able to um, figure out how much the improvement would be. So that if the improvement was enough, we could say, let's work on trying to merge. If the improvement wasn't very much, and that was actually, our estimate was the improvement for the first two teams we approach wasn't going to be very much. We said, thank you, but no. Um, but there was a team that hadn't actually shown up on the leaderboard in the first year, but was doing very well in the second year called Big Chaos. And they had moved into second place behind us. And when we uh, combined entries with them, it looked like we were going to get like 0.2% improvement with them just by averaging our best result with their best result. And maybe um, by working with them a little more, we could get more of an improvement. So we actually got together and we uh, um, merged with them. It, took about, it takes about two or three months to merge uh, with, a, um, with a, a company like AT&T because you need to, um, well, you need to, um, we need to uh, sign a contract and, you know, negotiate over, you know, how the money, prize money would be split and things like that. But um, uh, we eventually merged with them. And at the end of the, f the second year of the competition, we were at 9.44 percent and uh, won a second progress prize. And so here's here's here is the uh, the, the team we we merged with. It's a couple of uh, of graduate students from um, Austria. Um, Michael Jarrar on the left and Andre Andreas uh, Tosher on the right. And um, they've done some really great th things, especially in terms of blending. And so bringing on another team turned out to be very very valuable in uh, in moving our uh, um, moving our team forward. Um, so anyway, that was sort of the second year. The third year, um, there were sort of three teams that were worth mentioning. Uh, one was a one-person team called Dace that had moved up the leaderboard. A second was a, a pair of a pair of men, um, uh, Pragmatic Theory, which had also moved up the leaderboard. Um, both of those had been nowhere on the, maybe not even competing during the first year, um, but moved up um, fairly close to us. And then there was another team called Grand Prize Team, um, which was actually the uh, Gravity and Dinosaurs team, but had come up with a method that basically they, they advertised and said, join our team, join the Grand Prize Team, and if you join our team, we will split the million dollars with you in proportion to the amount that you improve the result. So they were starting at like 9.2%. And they said, OK, if you can improve, us, improve the score to 9.3%, you'll get uh, like 10% of, uh, of the final prize. And so uh, fortunately, that, didn't, that team wasn't taking off. It, did, it, it got some, some people to join quickly. but. Uh, not a lot. So we were still in the we were still in the lead, but we were starting to get a little worried. And so uh, again, it looked like it was going to be very difficult for our team to make it up to 10 percent. So we approached pragmatic theory, and um, and said, "Would you be interested in uh, combining with us?" We did the noise thing to see how much improvement there would be, and it looked like there'd be a, an improvement of about 0.2 or something. And that was going to by the based on where we were at the time, it looked like that was going to get us pretty close to 10 percent. Um, and so um, everybody agreed. It took us a while again to come together. Um, and um, near the end, but partway through the negotiation, we learned something about, um, about them related to uh, this slide. So Netflix, the Netflix rules had a paragraph that said that you couldn't, that residents of certain places were not allowed to uh, participate in the competition. And you might be able to guess some of those places. Uh, um, we're, we're sort of getting the axis of the evil here. Um, and then it uh, ends up with... <laughs> well, unfortunately, the uh, pragmatic theory guys uh, lived in Montreal. And, um, you know, we'd all seen this, we'd all seen um, the rules and it sort of s skipped over this part about where you couldn't, 
where you couldn't reside. Um, but this was going to cause a problem because we couldn't, we couldn't merge with somebody who was not even supposed to have downloaded the data. Um, and so it turns out the reason for this rule is that Montreal has very, or Quebec has very strict rules about sweepstakes. So, you know, the McDonald's scratch off games where you go to McDonald's, they give you these things and you scratch it off and put it on a board or something and maybe you win a cheeseburger or something. Um, that's basically outlawed in Quebec. If you have some sort of sweepstakes, you're supposed to actually put in escrow 10% of the winning prize um, if Quebec residents are allowed to um, compete. And so the lawyers for Netflix had basically decided, hey, we don't want to deal with this. We'll just bar anybody from Quebec. Um, so anyway, we had, we had essentially agreed to combine with them, but we realized that we had to get this clarified. So um, Chris, who had a good relationship with Netflix, contacted them, sent them an email and said, you know, we're thinking of, we'd like to combine with this other team, but there's this rule. Um, are you really serious about this rule? And we got an email back almost immediately saying, um, well, they've been disqualified and then we're taking them off to the leaderboard. Um, and um, one of the guys from Pragmatic Theory wrote back and said, we don't understand why in the world is, why are we not um, eligible? Um, because the sweepstakes, this, you know, it's the same sort of thing that, you know, what's a game of chance? What's a game of skill? This hopefully was considered a game of skill. Um, and about two or three days later, we got a response from Netflix saying, we've changed the rules. <laughs> Actually, we never got a response. They sent something, on, they put something on the forum saying, we've changed the rules, we've taken out this, this sentence, and suddenly pragmatic theory was back into the game. Uh, so anyway, this was the leaderboard um, right, before, right before we announced our merger with pragmatic theory. I don't know if you can read the numbers. Uh, they were in first place at 9.8 percent. We act, we, our name at this point was uh, Belcor's, Belcor and Big Chaos after our merger. Uh, we actually had a better score than 9.8 percent, but we quit submitting for a while because the guys from Pragmatic Theory said, um, would you allow us to pass you because in case we're, in case we're um, disqualified, we'd like to at least have been in first place so we can take a snapshot of the leaderboard. Uh, <laughs> And since we, were, since we were joining with them, we said, sure, that's fine. So anyway, at this point, they were at 9.8%. We could have been a little bit better. But the combined team, by this point, um, was over 10%. We knew that we could get to 10.05%. And in fact, later in the day, we did that. Um, so we jumped to, up to 10.05%. The next teams after us, you can see the grand prize team was just a little bit back. Um, Dace was a little bit back. Um, none of the other teams were, the other teams were just, um, you know, related to those, those first three or four teams. Um, the next best independent team was Opera Solutions down at 9.2 percent. Well, as soon, so the, the rules of the competition said that once somebody reached 10 percent, they didn't get a million dollars. What happened is there was a 30-day uh, period where anybody could try to catch them and, and do as well as possible. Um, we were allowed to improve, try to improve our result during that 30 days, but the result was going to, the winner was going to be determined on who was, by who was ahead at the end of 30 days. Um, and it was not going to be based upon the, this leaderboard, but actually on the test leaderboard that nobody is seeing. So as soon as we passed uh, 10%, we actually did get up to 10.05 later in that day, uh, other t some other teams started combining. Grand Pi's team, of course, started collecting more people. Uh, this team, Opera Solutions, um, started uh, soliciting other people to join it. And there was another team, Vandalay Industries. Yes, the, San <laughs> the Seinfeld Grand Vandalay Industries, um, which was um, uh, Newman. And um, I think Newman was the head of that team. Anyway, they started combining as well. And so suddenly, um, within 19 days, um, a bunch of teams had come much closer to us. Grand Prize team was now within striking distance of us. Opera Solutions and Vandalay Industries had actually combined, so they were right behind us. Um, and it was starting to, look, starting to look a little bit closer. We 
we're holding back a little bit. We could get to 10.08%, but there was no telling whether somebody would catch us. And then for the next 10 days or so, things went silent. Nobody was moving. Um, and that was actually scarier than when people were moving towards us. Um, so again, the second to last day was the critical day. On the second to last day, um, we um, submitted our 10.08, but, but, and then right after we submitted our 10.08, um, a new team called the Ensemble, uh, which was an uh, ironic name, um, passed us at 10.09. The Ensemble was a combination of Grand Prize team along with Opera Solutions and Vandalay United. Um, it was, I think, 33 people from 23 original teams. Um, um, so we got to 10.08, they hit 10.09. On the last day, we struggled and struggled. We got to 10.09, um, they got to 10.10. .10. But again, this is just on the quiz data, so we, nobody knew. So the competition ends, nobody actually knows who had won. And we're all sitting by our computers waiting for an email from Netflix, hoping they're going to tell us that we had won. Uh, and nothing happened for about 45 minutes. And then finally, Chris got an email saying that we actually had one. Um, and, but, the, but the results were amazingly close. So um, here were the results on the test uh, data set. So low is better. This is root mean squared error. This was the ensemble score. This was our score. Um, but the problem was that the, the rules say the scores are rounded to four significant digits. So we are back to tied. <laughs> and the tiebreaker was submission date and time. And it turns out that we submitted, we made our final submission about 20 minutes before they made their final submission. And so that was the difference. So anyway, here is, here is the team. Uh, uh, on the left is Reed Hastings, who is the uh, CEO of Netflix. Next to him, uh, one of his assistant, or, uh, one of his officers, Neil Hunt, uh, Yehuda Koren, then the um, two Martins. It's Martin Chabert and Martin Piat from Pragmatic Theory, um, who, uh, and Michael and Andreas from Big Chaos. All four of those guys were great. They um, had lots of great ideas and um, really did make a tremendous difference. Chris Walensky, and then uh, I'm the last one there. So um, that's, sort of the, that's sort of the story. One of the questions I always get asked is, well, what did you do with the money? Um, and um, being, uh, working, for, working for a corporation, um, our thoughts are their thoughts. Um, <laughs> Our intellectual property is their intellectual property. So the the AT and T's portion of the our portion of the uh, the million dollars actually did go to AT and T. But we we're very proud that we were able to uh, uh, convince AT and T to um, to donate all of it to uh, organizations that support uh, science and technology education, um, particularly for uh, women and minorities. So. Um, <laughs> That's where, that's where most of the money, that's where the, uh, uh, the grand, our part of the grand prize money went to. So anyway, thank you for your attention. Well, thank you for, thank you for a great talk. Um, we do have posters outside, but if there are a couple of questions from the audience, I'm sure we could uh, field them now. At the front? <laughs> well, I mean, we were, we were very lucky. Yes. I was wondering if I had a job uh, during this time. And um, it was very lucky that there was, there's a lot of freedom to figure out what to work on. And our justification really is that this, is, this was learning sort of a new area that didn't have an obvious obvious benefits to AT&T but at the time, but that um, we figured recommender systems was going to be something that was growing. And in fact, uh, we do have some projects involved with recommender systems. And to some extent, I felt like even if we never did anything in this particular area, 
the work on figuring out how to do big models, how to do regularization, was uh, an important part of our work. And um, I should say that we had three um, uh, conference papers, sort of serious conference papers, uh, published out of this, and several other uh, more expository papers coming out of it. So um, it sort of really did fit in with our with our job titles of research. Well, when when you have, I think everybody heard that question. Uh, I, when you have more um, when you have more parameters and observations, you better be shrinking a lot. <laughs> I mean, there's sort of a notion of of degrees of freedom and effective degrees of freedom, and the effective degrees of freedom was clearly far far less than the number of observations. Um, so it was critically important in that. It was also critically important. Um, I didn't really get into it, but when we were doing this combining, we were basically doing linear combinations of, of estimators. In the first year, it was 107. By the last year, we had a linear combination of 800 different methods. And even when it's being trained on, on 1.4 million cases, um, it was very important to do shrinkage there as well. And so... Um, uh, we, we put a lot of effort into everything we did was involved shrinkage or regularization of some sort. Um, fortunately, fortunately, I wasn't in charge of that very much. Uh, my, um, my computing skills are very, very poor, but Yehuda was a whiz at things, and he was, he was able to... Um, 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 be very effective at, you know, doing things like storing uh, the um, the ratings in three bits, <laughs> as opposed to a full using a full byte for them in his programs. Um, and um, at least that was early on. Later on, we were just using machines with more uh, more memory. Um, in terms of computing time, that very biggest model took about three weeks to run, or about a month to run. Um, it didn't really take a month full. What happened was he started running, and uh, after about a week, there was a power failure. <laughs> so he had to restart it, and then there was a crash or something. So he had to start running it three times. But, um, but uh, you know, it really did help to have very good, very good computing skills and good, uh, and, um, good equipment. getting to wonder where your dessert was? The answer is that it's outside with the posters. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs>